The people ate and were well satisfied, for the Lord gave them grain from heaven. They would not disappoint. For he gave them what they craved. Hear my teaching, all oh, my people. Incline your ear to the words of my mouth. People ate and were well satisfied, for the Lord gave them grain from heaven. They were not disappointed. For he gave them what they craved. Thus is the high and lofty one who mm, <laughs> thus is the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity whose name is holy and dwell in the high and holy place and also with the one who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the hearts of the contrite let us confess our sins against god and our neighbor most, Most merciful, merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may love you your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And, and our, our mouth shall proclaim your, your praise. Glory, glory to the Father, and to the, the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. I say the Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Hear my plea of innocence, O oh Lord, give heed to my cry. Listen to my prayer, which does not come from Let my vindication 
Genesis. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Kelly, uh, can you try unmuting yourself there? Sorry about that. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. From them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord is my shepherd.
is my shepherd, I shall not want. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured the sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. But they replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, guys, it is lovely to see everyone here. So I, uh, for the foreseeable future, um, I will be broadcasting from my office. And then I wish I could broadcast from our church, but we don't have internet there. And then if we can find a way, I don't know, to run a line or something out there, maybe we can make that work. Uh, But maybe in the future, I'll get creative with where I film around the parish house. We'll see. And so I'm not sure if you know this, but before I went to seminary, um, so right after college, I went to uh, EMT school. So I'm a certified Georgia EMT. Um, It's the I-85 class, which is now called an EMT advanced. Um, And then so, and I loved that class. It's a, uh, it takes a very long time to get into seminary. And I knew that I wanted to go to seminary right after college, but I needed to make money and wanted to do something meaningful. So that was going to be my thing. And I loved going to EMT school. Um, I was really, really good at it. And I, I don't mean to brag, but like I, it was my jam. It really was. I understood and absorbed all of the protocols super quickly. Um, I had an awesome little study group, uh, kind of like from uh, that TV show community, if you watched that 10 years ago. And every day we were, or it was Tuesdays and Thursdays for three hours, we would uh, uh, commute together to this little community college out in the middle of nowhere and take these classes and run scenarios. And I got picked up by a service right after I graduated. It was a year long course. And I was absolutely addicted to the adrenaline rush. And I worked on an advanced life support unit. So uh, we were answering 911 calls and my partner was always a paramedic who has another year of training in addition to myself. So that means that I got to drive and I love driving ambulances. Um, And it was one of those things where it hardwired my brain to constantly be aware of something terrible that was going to happen around me. And, uh, and then late at night, I would stay up thinking how I should have done things differently, what I should have done and different calls. And, and then a lot of that was this futile. Um, you know, once those things have passed, it's good to think critically. It's really bad to obsess. And then so by the time I went to seminary, I almost went through adrenaline withdrawals. Um, I missed running calls so very bad. Um, I couldn't just pick up a job as an EMT up in Virginia. Uh, it would have taken a long time to do that. And I needed to focus on my studies. And then something weird started to happen. This this was actually a thing. People would have these severe medical emergencies all around me, all of the time. 
Um, I think while I was in seminary, I, just by stupid luck, um, five people had grand mal seizures right next to me. And I was the first responder. And it wasn't just even on campus. A couple were on campus. Um, but it was like one time after we kind of took our big priest exam at the uh, tail end of uh, seminary, we all went on a little retreat to Delaware. And then this random guy in the restaurant had a grand mal seizure right next to us. And then I ran the scene. And it, it kind of messed me up, to be honest. Um, initially, I was kind of thankful that I could be the person responding to it, but it was just like constantly my eyes were shifting, trying to figure out where that next emergency was going to come from. And I, and I had like this sort of idea that I was going to be a parish priest and I could still volunteer for a fire service or an EMT service. And then um, when I was a hospital chaplain, which is part of our training in Chattanooga, I, I was doing that five days a week and on the weekends I was running EM, EMS calls in Georgia and, uh, um, and it just burned me out so bad. And I had this massive epiphany that I couldn't do both. And so I let my license lapse. I decided that I couldn't emotionally be there for a congregation the way that I needed to and also be an EMT that it, it, it was going to lead me to burnout. I just did not have that in me. And it was weird. It was like that was lifted. But then every once in a while, every once in a while, when I trick myself into thinking I'm in a pretty good place, something happens. Um, and then so something happened this last Friday. Um, it, and it started off as a really good day. And then something, I, I really like manual labor. Um, I was also a machinist and a man, general laborer in a factory when I was in college. And I love that sort of work, just working with my hands. So I spent the whole morning chopping wood in my backyard, which is my favorite chore to do. Um, my hands felt uh, uh, dirty and callous. And then I loaded up my truck with all of it. <laughs> so I can't bring myself to throw away a glass bottle. So we hoard glass bottles in our basement. And about two or three times a year, we drive it all the way to Danville and then just do this massive load of glass recycling. We hadn't done this in six months. So I loaded up the truck with all the glass and I was driving down 58. And I was talking with my mom, you know, not with a handheld, but you know, over the Bluetooth. And then um, I crested this hill and then there was complete pandemonium. There were three cars, um, two of which were very severely damaged. And then there was a woman who was writhing in the street in a pile of broken glass. And then this person who clearly did not know what they were doing. So I told my mom I had to go. And Peanut loves riding in the truck with me. And I had to slam on the brakes. And she did not like that. And I ran to the scene. And then fortunately, there was a, a police officer in an unmarked vehicle that was right behind me. And then so he and I were the first people on the scene. And then so there was two, uh, we call them walking wounded. So they were injured, but when you ask them to come to you, they can. And then, so that means that they're not critical. And then two people were fine and one woman was critically injured. And for 20 minutes, me and this nurse who also arrived on the scene, she was a CNA, she's a, a home health nurse. We, we ran it and then it was, maybe a couple of minutes after we got there, we kind of looked at ourselves and we were so in emergency mode. We're like, oh, and there's a pandemic going on. So we took turns going back, getting our masks. We couldn't find any other protective equipment. And the woman slowly lost consciousness um, over the time we were there. And then me and this young nurse just tried our best to keep her awake. And it's one of those things like, you know, when you start to run calls like that, you think you're gonna save people's lives. I don't think I ever saved a single life. Um, you know, even when you do those dramatic things where you like really bring people back to life, they almost always die the next day and it's terrible and it's a hard thing to sort of come to terms with. And then, so this nurse and I, we did everything we could to a show compassion and then to make people feel calmer on the scene because we knew what we were doing and, um, and we just try to be there for this woman passed off reports to the EMTs when they got there a while later. And um, then I got back in my truck and left. And then so showing compassion in that way is not hard. 
And uh, for some people, it can emotionally scar you, especially if you make kind of a career out of doing that sort of emergency work. Um, you never really get the time to digest what's happening in front of you. And then I actually, I don't, it, it's amazing how well I sort of emotionally process that whole thing. Um, like I, I feel good about everything that happened. Of course, like looking back on it, I wish I had done my initial exam a little bit differently. I wish I'd grabbed my mask as soon as I got out of my truck. And, um, but it, it was fine. And I'm sure if any one of you, and then I'm not sure if my, my two rules in doing church is, is pretend like you know what you're doing and do it slowly. You can actually run a, a, a traffic accident much the same way. You, you may not have the skills to like stop bleeding or doing any of that sort of thing, but just being a calm presence. And if someone's freaking out, not knowing what to do, you can say, Hey, I need you to stand right there and do that. You, you call 911. You, you're going to give this report. I need you to hold her head in a neutral inline position and do not let go until you are relieved. Um, if you can just go in there and then create some sort of semblance and show compassion, and try to be calm, you can do real tangible good. And anybody can do it. And then the thing is, is this police officer and I, we were the first two people that just happened across them. And anybody would have done the same thing. What is a lot more difficult is when you create a culture where you can accept people's brokenness systemically. Um, all of us, all of you watching from home, or if you're Ellen Maxwell, if you're watching from the beach, and we're all very jealous of you, Ellen, um, then uh, you, you're part of our community. And all of us, myself included, I, I, I take a lot of effort into making myself appear put together. I hide my brokenness. I, I try to, you know, be that calm presence and all that stuff. But I'm broken. I have my issues. And all of you have yours as well. But every once in a while, in this community of trust, we let ourselves become vulnerable. We let our brokenness rise to the surface. And then also, um, well, it used to be once a month, we would let people in to our undercroft and we would try to facilitate community. And then we would provide meals and we would try to send people home with food as well. And then just like our gospel lesson today, it's our loaves and fishes ministry. And then it's interesting in when people would start to come in they would get to the door easily an hour or more before we would serve dinner they a just wanted to be the first in line which is fine but they also crave something else they craved community and just walking around with people knowing that i'm a pastor they would pull me aside like hey can you pray with me and then our members who kind of take it upon themselves to go around and let people know that they love them many of them found that these people that they had never met before opened up to them about all these terrible things happening in their lives. They just wanted their story uh, to be told. And then cultivating this sort of ministry is much harder. If you come across someone whose brokenness is abundantly clear, someone writhing in a street that's in pain, you don't have a choice but to stop. It takes a truly callous person to just keep on driving and say, that's their problem, not mine. But it takes a brave person to actually open up the doors and say, this is the space where you can let down your guard. You can let your brokenness be shown. If you're hungry, if something's happening in your life and food makes you financially insecure, then you can come and you can get a good meal. And if you come and you're lonely, we will give you community. That takes courage. You don't have to do that. On Wednesday nights, you don't have to go and cook for other people. You don't have to go and try to show them the love of Christ. That's not expected. And it takes courage and drive and determination. And then what we've been doing since the pandemic started is um, a small group. And then we try to keep it small in order to avoid cross-contamination and having as few variables as possible. But a small group of people 
I've been providing meals every Wednesday for close to 100 people. And that's truly remarkable. In our community, there's a lot of pain and hunger and financial and food insecurity uh, that can be easily avoided. It, like, you, like avoided is, is you don't have to see it. Unless if you open up your doors, unless if you put out that sign and say, we are here for you, or if you go out and look for those people, you, you won't see them. They're invisible. But it's this sort of ministry that we see Christ do with the ministry of the loaves and fishes, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. They followed him. He had every reason to send them away and get something to eat. But instead, he made it very clear to his followers and to everyone that was there that they were exactly where they needed to be. They felt compelled to be near him. They weren't asking for food. The disciples said that. But even then, knowing that they could be hungry, he broke bread and he blessed it and he gave it to them. And then they were filled in a number of different ways. All of a sudden, they felt the love of God. They saw someone who was impossibly God and man. And then they got their stomachs full as well. In the same way, we're called to show compassion. And then it's the undramatic moments that require the most courage, the most perseverance, and the most faith. And then so we need to continue, even while we're called to be separated from one another, to cultivate that sort of ministry. To open the doors to brokenness, to yours, to mine, to everyone else's. To let down our own guard. And if we can do that, then others can do it as well. And then we can start to pass around the basket and realize that there is an abundance in our community and in our church. There's an abundance of food, of material needs and wealth. There's also an abundance of grace and mercy. But if we never say that you can be broken here, and if we never give ourselves to be broken in this place, to be messy, to be in pain, to be sad, to be lonely, then we will never receive that grace in turn. Amen. Let's affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let, Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving, saving health, health among all nations. 
Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the Lord of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite your prayers. Pray, pray especially for Lou, Julia, Scott, Marie, Pam, John, Hilda, Mike, Sarah, Jane, Larry, David, Pete, Rusty, Darlene, Sharon, Ula, Kathy, Ron, Kathy, Carolia. Pat, Catherine, Linda, Crystal, Tammy, Mallory, 
James, Rocky, Catherine, Mary Ruth, Melissa, Alzina, Colette, Linda, Jimmy, and Lewis. Pray also for Bill and Mary, Mark and Micah. Are there others? Let's conclude now with the general thanksgiving. All right, I think I'm having some technical difficulties. All of you are frozen, just in case if you can still hear me. I'm going to go ahead and read the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, do give thee humble and most hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. 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 My friends, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind and go forth in the name of Christ. Be to God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Two, three, four. Quick to glad in the